Well, welcome everyone. We are so happy to have you here uh, on behalf of Naming Virginia. My name is Lakaija Lang and I am on the advisory council for the Naming Virginia chapter. And I am so excited to have you all here today. We are going to have such a, a dynamic conversation with some dynamic leaders from a variety of industries. And we are here to talk about Step Up and Stand Out, your roadmap to a career success. So if you're ready to step up and stand out, go ahead and put in the chat, yes, I am, because we are ready for you. All right, so I'm going to, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator and our panelists, and so I'll tell you a little bit about them. First up, we have Niall. He is the moderator for the event, but he is also the president of our NAMIC Virginia chapter. He is a purpose-driven servant senior leader in the HR resources, the human resources professional space. He has over 20 years of broad HR experience and a demonstrated record in building positive employee relations, mentoring, developing people, and creating a dynamic culture. He has worked for organizations such as Ardent Mills, ConAgra Foods, Kraft Foods Global, the YMCA of Southampton Roads, and Cox Communications in a variety of HR roles in operational capacities. He is a community volunteer with the Cub Boy Scouts of America, and he is family or a family-oriented husband and father of four. Welcome, Niall. Next up, we have Damon. Damon is responsible for leading the talent needs for Cox Enterprises, and his role requires that he designs, implements, and directs internal and external recruitment programs to drive talent acquisition strategies across multiple functional areas and organizational levels. He has held numerous positions supporting multiple divisions and functional areas. In addition to working at Cox, prior to coming to Cox, he worked at Graphic Packaging International, AT&T, Level 3 Communications, and Aerotech Technical Staffing. He is a proud husband and father. Next, I'm going to go over to Frances. She is an executive at Cox Communications in the Customer Care Department where she leads the recruiting and onboarding teams, as well as account services and technical support for customer care. She serves as a board member for the Boys and Girls Club, a grade level advisor with the National Charity League, and is a 2019 graduate of Leadership Louisiana. Frances enjoys spending time with her husband and daughter, and in her free time, she enjoys working with her church family, volunteering with her daughter through philanthropic supports, um, supported by NCL and providing mentoring to career professionals due, through the Black Career Women's Network. Welcome, Francis. Next, we have Mary, Mary Susan Schilling. She is currently the Chief Engagement and Talent Development Advisor at Hear Me Roar Coaching and Consulting, a company she started to empower employees to take control of their careers, to foster a growth mindset, and to close the wage gap. Mary's career in media spans 25 plus years, most of which she spent at Time Warner Cable and Charter Communications, where she was director of traffic for news and local programming. Her most fulfilling role was that of an advisor, mentor, engagement facilitator, facilitator and coach to her staff and colleagues. She is a supportive ally, as well as a member of some media industries such as the Women's Collective, the WIC Network New York, and various other diversity councils and affinity groups. And we will round out this great panel with Kathy. Kathy Ross, she is a senior director analyst at Gartner. She is part of the company's customer service and support team. Her primary focus is on self-service, digital channel effectiveness, and multi-channel strategy and design. She advises primarily and primarily end user organizations, but she also has um, expertise in technology and service providers on adoption, technology trends, and the business value of technology. Kathy is a dog mom of four. She has two golden retrievers and two golden noodles. She spends time hiking, dog diving at the nearest docks, swimming, and traveling to national parks for big adventures. I told you all they were dynamic. 
we are going to get started. Get your note-taking skills ready. There's a, a lot of actionable gems that I'm sure will be dropped today. Niall, I'm handing it over to you. All right. Thank you, Lakaisha, for the warm, warm, warm welcome. Um, and again, thank you for your leadership of Damon, Virginia and serving on the um, advisory board as well. And again, thank you to our esteemed panelists today. Uh, we're certainly looking forward to um, learning more about how all team members can participate in their career success. And certainly as Lakaisha spoke of, um, it's our goal and our hope that you take away some things that you can apply. You know, certainly we, we can see sometimes these conversations. Uh, we don't want to talk about um, concepts that hopefully are not uh, unreachable, but these are things that you can also take back and apply. So if there's a few things you take back, then this event has been a success. All right. So um, as folks know, you know, when I get started with meetings, you know, I like to keep it light, you know, try to try to knock down some some tension in the room where it might be. Uh, so we're going to start with a couple of couple of jokes. Y'all ready for some jokes? Are you ready? All right. All right. All right. So don't kill the messenger. All right. Don't kill the messenger. Let's just be easy with this. All right. So joke for you, you know, what does what does a grape say when the grape gets stepped on? What does the grape say when the grape gets stepped on? Nothing. Just lets out a little wine. No, that was okay. No, no, hey, Kathy's, it was, it was Kathy's, all right. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> no worries, no worries at all. No worries at all. No worries at all. All right. So one, one more joke. One more joke. Then we'll get started with the meeting. Keep things light. Keep it light. What do you call two chips that fall in love? Two chips that just fall in love. A relation dip. A relation dip. Fall in love. All right. All right. I'll keep my day job. Um, as we work through things here. Okay. Well, again, uh, yeah, I got I got a little bit of love in the chat, a little bit of love in the chat, but I'll keep my day job. All right. So I'll see if I can pepper the afternoon uh, with a few jokes, but certainly uh, we're very excited to uh, be a part of this discussion today. And just to get things started, I got a question um, for the panel um, and feel free, anyone to go off mute and, and, and walk through your answer for this question. So if money was no object, where would you travel and why? Money was no object. Where would you travel and why? Maybe why don't we just start off with uh, Catherine? Why don't you get us started there? If money was no object, where would you travel and why? Okay, I I, I think we've uh, already kind of shared the the big um, the big adventure for me is national parks, and so um, I, I like to travel with my family, and it's road trips, national parks, anything to do with dogs and hiking, um, and being outside. Um, but for me, you know, it's time. You know, so I want to maximize my time with my family. I don't want to have to necessarily have a rigid schedule or roadmap. I want to kind of be free with my time and really um, spend it in the moment. Um, and so for me, it's just simply being outside with my family, whether it's national parks or even at home and uh, and not having any time constraints um, whatsoever. Appreciate that. Appreciate that, Catherine. And what I heard really a lot about that, too, was really unplugging trying to find ways to totally unplug. I think a national park could accomplish that. Certainly. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, and, 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 but again, having boundaries and, but also having some fun around that. So I appreciate you sharing that. You bet. Yeah. Francis, what are your thoughts? Well, now I will tell you, I am polar opposite from Kathy. Uh, as if we are traveling, I want to maximize all the time. I will come in with a spreadsheet. Uh, my family accepts the feedback and I make corrections uh, along the way. But if money were no object on the bucket list, will absolutely be Bora Bora um, because of the pristine beaches. And I am just itching to stay in an overwater bungalow. Uh, so we will take our itinerary and rest when we get back um, would be where we would go. Nice, nice. Bora Bora. OK, thanks for sharing. Spreadsheet. Nothing wrong with being organized. Absolutely. And I'm if sure. you'd like me to share, I have plenty for several destinations. Very cool. Very cool. Do you do it after action review? After the vacation? Occasionally. Okay. All if right. the itinerary was too full and I got feed forward. Okay. Absolutely. Always room for continuous improvement. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Thank you for sharing that. Damon? Yeah. So my initial thought was like the Maldives and the kind of the over the water bungalow as well. But I'll tell you another one of mine is I'm a soccer fan. So I have this idea of going to see a professional game in Italy, Spain and England kind of all in the same trip, just kind of hopping 
uh, from country to country and watching, uh, you know, soccer in, in Europe. Awesome. That's that's cool. Yeah. Uh, no, that's pretty cool. Enjoying your sport that you love and kind of seeing yeah. it all over the world. That's wrong with that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mary, money was no object. Money was no object. I, you know, I think I'm somewhere between Kathy and Francis in terms of I either don't plan and just spend time with family or I plan and I make sure we hit all the points. But if I had money was no object, I would love to do a world cruise and stop in as many places as possible and just getting off the ship and meeting the people in those cultures. And that's one of the fun things for me. I like the beach vacations, I love them. And I also love going to museums and doing tours of the places I'm at. But if I can combine that in a world tour, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I saw in the chat there and the food. Yeah, so it's nothing yeah. like- and it's, like, it's wonderful to explore those cultures and you get out and you have such a different perspective when you come back. And it's a great way to build up your people skills, your communication skills, and just really learning about the world around us, which yeah. is also one of my tips for improving your skills. I like it. I like it. So so already you're hearing from the panel, stepping up and standing out, even with their vacation time, um, just doing some different things to really unplug. And um, certainly, you know, I think, you know, we, we work, everybody works hard, but it's also important to play hard as well. And there's nothing wrong at all with, um, you know, doing some things that, you know, help you to round you out as a professional, because you never know when you get in situations where that vacation experience might help you in a conversation or the experience that you, you do, that you um, became a part of or learned will help you get ahead because you're just sharing who you are. And uh, that's a similar interest to someone else. So I appreciate you all for sharing, uh, sharing those nuggets about your vacation piece. Yeah. And so one question I do have for the panel also in general is you think about your careers and we all have those moments, right? Where, you know, we, we make mistakes, we learn from those mistakes, we learn and we move on from that. But we also sometimes have those, you know, those North Star moments where it's like, you know, I really knocked this stuff out of the park. I really had an experience that really helped me personally or helped the organization or somebody else move forward. So my question for the panel is, what is, if you can find that one nugget what is your greatest career accomplishment? And I'm going to kind of turn the order around here a bit. Um, you know, Mary, maybe we'll start with you. You know, just look at your career. What has been one of your greatest accomplishments? You know, I, I really do think, and I've done, you know, I've been on launch teams, launched, you know, being part of launching some news channels, and that was exciting and wonderful. And, but I really think what I find most prideful and what I really get more accomplishment out of is watching my team develop. So I think that's really what I would highlight as my career achievement and be like working with WICT and NAMIC and, and really just helping people to be their best selves. And I think that's where, you know, I didn't need to be like high up on the ladder because I really got a lot of enjoyment out of seeing my team flourish and having them also realize that maybe they weren't on the right career path and helping them move out of the industry into what they really would be flourishing in. So I would say that that's really it. The mentoring, the advising, and the coaching is probably where I find my greatest achievement. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and certainly in working with people and, and helping them find their passion. Yes. Um, sometimes it comes with some very eye-opening discussions. Yes. And, oh, um, yeah. You know, and a lot of times they sit and they're doing the job, but they're not loving the work. And it becomes a drudgery and then they become stagnant and then they become, you know, I don't want to say bitter, but sometimes people, when they feel stuck, they lose momentum and they don't uh, engage. So when you can help them move into the path that they're meant to be, that's really, that's really where it's at for me. Yep. And as a mentor, you know, it's important that we create that space for those conversations to take place. Exactly. So, and, and give people permission to be, them, be themselves. I appreciate that, Mary. Yeah. Damon, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so similar to Mary, I think for me, being in TA and talent acquisition for as long as I have, you know, some of my kind of greatest accomplishments when I look back is looking at individuals that I've hired over the years and watch their careers grow and, and flourish, um, you know, from interns that are now directors or uh, interns that were with us at one point at Cox and now they're, you know, DJs and work at Facebook and they're doing these, you know, these great things and just seeing walking around campus here in Atlanta and just seeing people that like, yeah, I, I hired them back in, you know, 06 or 07 and just seeing their career progress. Um, 
I think really ties into why I do what I do within the TA space, because it's really seeing and helping one, the company achieve their goals, but then also just seeing people grow from a career standpoint and knowing I had a, a piece in bringing them on board. Um, it's probably like my biggest accomplishment from a career perspective. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I love it. You know, certainly, you know, kind of seeing people, that flower grow, you know, from a very, you know, the emphasis of someone's career um, is, is an awesome thing to see and great progress that people make. So appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Francis, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so lots of similarities here. Um, and I can attest that there are many moments where I can look at things from a personal standpoint and really just being with pride. But what stands out for me also is witnessing the growth of those that I've supported, either from a mentoring perspective or advisor perspective, and really seeing them walk in their purpose. Uh, that certainly is what gives me a sense of accomplishment, knowing the role that I've played and helping them navigate their career journey. Yeah, yeah, that, that purpose piece is, is, is sometimes is there. You just got to help people realize that it's there. And um, again, give people permission to have those conversations those discussions, but um, you know, I will say also too, you know, you know, sometimes you run into situations too where um, folks need to kind of turn their careers around a bit. You know, they're 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 you know um, you know uh, not necessarily they're they're kind of in that defunct phase, or or they've made a number of mistakes and they don't know what to do. Um, so whether it be you know, like Mary talked about, you know, finding new passions or just the the real uh, piece around people kind of selling in and say, you know what, I'm going to work through this thing, and you kind of see them turn things around. So it's, it's a great thing to see. Great thing to see. Yeah. Kathy, what are your thoughts? Great as a compliment. My thoughts are, it's, it's not a good feeling to go last on this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, my, my answer would be extremely similar to everyone else's. I mean, you know, it's, it's really about fostering the development of others and, and seeing them, um, you know, succeed in their career. You know, I think specifically for me, um, you know, it's, it's been very fulfilling to help instill confidence in leaders and especially female leaders. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's really helping them understand you're doing this already and you can do this. So let's go ahead and move forward and overcome that fear and kind of seeing that all come together. Uh, so for me, again, very similar to others. Yeah. Yeah. And I think certainly, you know, with the comments that you made, you know, building confidence and inspiring people. I think we have a role whether you know you are you know an executive leader, you know whether you're a frontline employee, you know how are you how are we providing that level of inspiration where people understand um, how the work they do really translates to the business, right? But also to that relationship piece, how important that relationship is um, for us to get things done. Because I'm a full believer that if we invest in people and people see that and they believe in that, um, they will just charge the mountain for you, charge the mountain for you. Um, but as leaders, if 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 we're only talking to individuals when stuff is wrong. Where we got to drive a level of correction, and we've missed something in that relationship. So, appreciate you sharing that about you know really inspiring and really you know motivating folks and really making them um, see their purpose, see their purpose. So, you all share some really great themes around that. So, you know, kind of keeping in line with those things, I want to kind of walk through um, some key areas of being successful, and just want to get your thoughts and, and we'll open it up to the panel to, to kind of ask, ask answer these questions. But let's make some definitions first. So, we hear a lot about mentorship, sponsorship, advisors, you know, who are these folks? What are they supposed to be doing? So, um, you know, just walk through a few definitions and just to kind of set the stage for the next question. But, you know, you all might have heard of mentorship. And for the audience, mentorship is a formal or informal relationship between two people. Usually um, one has a more experienced person paired with someone, looking to guidance, gave some guidance and then really help them take them, their career to the next level. Sponsorship could be someone who uses their influence to make connections to open up career doors for another person and gives them grow opportunities to grow. And then advisors, someone you can learn from or someone that you can bounce things off of, bounce things off of. So for the panel, one question I have for you is, you know, how do you define these roles, right? And is there one of these roles that you lean upon as being, you know, um, helpful for you in your own career development? So mentorship, sponsorship, advisors, Open it up to the panel. Anyone's free to kind of speak to how do you define these roles and how any of these roles have helped you in your current success. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, I'll just say it's highly important to have someone that is taking the lead in shepherd, shepherding our career. 
and really offering us insight throughout our career journey. Um, it really is vital that we have um, a framework around our personal and professional needs and uh, having that awareness to be able to make that connection with others as they're trying to help us navigate uh, through that space. And certainly um, sponsorship um, and advisors, some of these sponsorship, I'd say, is the, the one key element in terms of impact. Certainly as we're looking to move up the corporate ladder, if you will, uh, in terms of folks leveraging their uh, professional currency and taking a risk and speaking on your behalf when you're not in the room. So it certainly comes with doing the work and having people have a profile of what you can accomplish to be able to risk their professional currency in terms of making recommendations on our behalf. Great comments. Great comments. Um, and before I speak, uh, Damon, it looks like, like you're unmuted. Go ahead and jump yeah. in there. Yeah. So for me, um, I lean heavily on advisors, um, you know, throughout my my career. Um, and it doesn't mean just advisors, uh, you know, above me. I look at and will talk to anyone on my team, uh, peers, you know, leadership because I think there's always something to learn, but then always something that you may not see um, because you might not be as close to the work as maybe your, your frontline employees. So just hearing their thoughts on situations uh, and maybe different topics has always helped me, I think, make better and smarter decisions. And then, of course, you know, when you need that, that kind of higher level preview to, to what a situation or a task, you know, how others have attacked or accomplished or solved those issues um, have always been beneficial to me. And I look not just in HR, you know, uh, like I said, I have the luxury of supporting various groups within the organization. So, you know, folks in customer care, folks in, in product and development, because, you know, they might see things very differently, you know, from, from maybe someone in sales versus someone in finance, right? So getting different point of views from just their expertise in their space has also helped me make decisions on how I, you know, communicate topics, um, how I solve problems, how I, you know, deal with maybe employee either performance issues or even how do I motivate and how do I, you know, uh, encourage. So lean heavily on advisors um, throughout from, from my career perspective. Uh, yes, yeah, that's, that's that's good feedback there. And you know, certainly, you know, the advisors and leaning on people, um, you know, professional currency, love that. You know, you know, we all make deposits and withdrawals with all these relationships, both personal and professional. Um, so, you know, great feedback, for, you know, from those two points there. Kathy or Mary, any other thoughts there on how you look at sponsorship, you know, advisors, mentorship, and and um, how you, you know you share your experience related to that. Well, I think I'm more um, in line with what Damon was saying about leaning heavily on advisors. I, I think most of my career and also in being an advisor to people, it, it really helps me develop my perspective if I'm not seeing something clearly. You know, sometimes we get in our own heads and we have our own story that's looping around and it's great to have a team of advisors. And, you know, some people refer to it as your personal board of directors, right? And it, and it's great to, to have that team that you can rely on for different things. The things I would talk to a mentor about might not be the same things I would talk to my advisor about. And developing the relationships with a broader scope of your colleagues is how you will develop those sponsorships. You don't always know who your sponsor is. You know, it's not something that we go around and say, hey, Niall, will you be my sponsor? You know, you just, you don't do that. But the sponsors find you based on your work, based on your relationships that you've built, based on the thing, how you interact with your team and your other colleagues. They find you. You don't always know who they are. So you always want to be, you know, doing your best because you never know who's watching you. And your sponsor could actually, doesn't have to be somebody higher up. It could be somebody on another, on another level of another department who sees what you're doing and speaks up on your behalf when they're with other people. So, but I do lean heavily on advisors, um, mainly to help me keep my perspective straight. And there's a couple of people on this call that um, I see Radia is somewhere on this call. She was here before. She's somebody that I've always um, touched base with and, and has gotten great advice from. So shout out to Radia. 
Shout out. Shout out to those advisors. <laughs> and Mary, you made me think about something in terms of your uh, feedback around things that we're doing on a daily basis. Anyone that has worked closely with me know that my mantra is we are interviewing every single day for our next opportunity. So as we are interacting with folks or things that we're doing from a work perspective, that is part of the interview process, yes. which happens far before a posting happens. So I love that perspective, Mary, great insight. And also too, when you're at networking events, keep that in mind, because mm -hmm. that's really key what you just said in that, in that because it's a different environment and people get a little looser in those environments. And you really need to know when you're networking, that's a professional setting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great feedback. Kathy, you want to jump in here? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I share, you know, similarities, uh, leaning, leaning heavily on advisors, but I guess think, you know, one thing I'd also say is, um, you know, think about it not only within your industry or within your company, leveraging advisors, but leveraging advisors all, you know, everywhere. So you don't know who you're going to run into and what their role may or may not be um, and the opportunities that you may uh, come across um, and recommendations and assistance that you might get from them. You know, just nuggets, little insights that you might get that will help you, that may help them um, and continue to develop your network. So, you know, advisors and advisory is not just within your company, but think about it much more broadly. Uh, that's that's great insight. I think that the, the normal tendency is to stick in house, right? I got to find my advisors, sponsorship mentors, in house, and so being broad and thinking about that, I think, is very important. And it, it also goes back to a term that you know sometimes you know we've used sometimes in this succession planning piece and and going into that room talking through talent is who's wearing this person's t-shirt, who's wearing this person's t-shirt, and those and so the comments that you all made around broadening our scope of mentorship advisors um, and sponsors kind of outside of your backyard, you know, your own department, right? Um, it's one thing for certainly your manager to be speaking on your behalf, but are you working on projects um, that are getting, getting you broad experience, broad exposure um, that allows more people to come into that room and put your t-shirt on and say, yes, this individual, I've seen them at work, um, and I, I concur with the, the comments that have been made by their manager or whatever it might be. So certainly keep those things in mind. And then one question I do have for the panel, and again, you know, everyone doesn't have to answer, but do I have to keep the same mentors, advisors, sponsors at my whole career? I mean, when do I know it's time to maybe, I don't know, move on, change sponsors up, you know, uh, give me some thoughts on, on that piece there. You know, I would say no. So the simple answer to your question is no. I don't think you have to keep the same advisors, you know, throughout the the, the length of your career. Um, I also feel like if you have strong relationships with, uh, you know, your advisors, it might die down or cool, but it's never completely goes away, right? So, and when we say move on, it's just to me, it's like you may not need them right now for whatever that particular situation, but if that relationship is strong and it's kind of a two-way, uh, you know, kind of relationship, because I think that's important as well, that that person will always be there, you know, when you need to to reach out and vice versa, right? Um, so for me, definitely don't have to have the same. And I've, you know, throughout my career, I haven't had the same advisors and kind of mentors or sponsors um, throughout my career. It's just, I think some of it is situational. Um, some of it's kind of in the moment, but I think even with all the individuals I've worked with in the past that I've considered advisors or sponsors or mentors, I think the relationships first were strong enough to where if I disappeared for a year and I called back up, you know, a year later, I think they would still pick up that phone because the relationship, you know, was strong enough before it even really became my advisor. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, exactly what you mean. Appreciate that. You know? Nothing. What I'd add here, Niall, is when you know that you need to shift, don't delay shifting. Have that conversation once you realize it. And really, to Damon's point, continue to cultivate that relationship, but also thank them for the investment they've provided so far uh, and determine how you can leverage that relationship moving forward. So on, don't delay and certainly be mindful of the time commitment uh, that they have provided to you and be thankful in that partnership that they've uh, provided. Yep. All 
And you know, sometimes too, the relationship shifts. You might be the mentee one day and you might be their mentor another day because roles might change, circumstances change, new technology comes in and maybe that's your expertise. And now you're going to mentor somebody else who may not know that and they might've been your mentor before. So it will evolve and you'll know when it's time to shift and your mentor will know when it's time for you to move on to somebody else. Um, but keeping that relationship and like Damon said that two, it's a two way street. It can't be transactional because then you're not developing the relationship and the relationship is key. So as long as you keep, even if you move on to something else, keep contacts with the people that you've developed a relationship with, because when you need them, if you haven't kept fostering it, when you need them, it's not the time to go back to them. All right. No, I appreciate, appreciate that feedback, everybody. Um, certainly, you know, here are keywords, relationship, relationship, relationship. Anything that we talk about today, you know, you certainly get out of it what you put into it. And so relationships take time to build. Um, you have to invest in those relationships. But I was also say, don't overthink it. You know, some people say, well, I got to get I got to get on Kathy's calendar and she's booked out for the next 30 days. It's like, well, can you get coffee with her for 15 minutes? You know, can you all walk in together from the parking lot? You know, so be creative around removing the boundaries of some or the structure of some of this. And, um, you know, certainly, you know, um, it's, it's OK to ask for help. It's okay to ask for opportunities for, for you to find creative ways. And I think that's the challenge now, considering that we're kind of in this hybrid environment. And um, sometimes we don't always see everybody every day, but you know, you have to be more intentional and, and you have to be more creative around how you get with people and um, get what you need so that you can be successful with what you need to do and stand out. Hey, now, now, would you mind if I just kind of chime in a little bit on that as far as being creative? You know, uh, one of my mentors told me one time um, about how he keeps in contact with with people, even people that he doesn't know very well. Uh, and he developed this concept called Rap K, and it was random acts of praise and kindness. Um, so he would even send one liners to leaders who won awards, just congratulating them on, you know, their award that they won. Or if you had a meeting with uh, with a person and found out, you know, their their kid loves soccer, if it saw something that he thought would resonate with them, he would send that article, you know, over or, you know, something about dogs or something about vacations, just randomly connecting with them through, you know, email or chat or whatever on things that are not even completely business related, but just, hey, we, we talked about, you mentioned your, you know, your daughters in the dance, saw this great, you know, article around dance recitals or something, you know, um, just thought you would be interested. So yeah. I've deployed that throughout my career um, and I've shared it with my teams. And, you know, and now I think it's something that, you know, we have implemented in, in just how we build relationships, you know, with, with our peers and with, uh, with business inside and outside. No, I love it. If you could put that in the chat, let's memorialize okay. that in the chat. <laughs> and, um, you know, certainly we got, uh, um, um, you know, we talked about, you know, some different topics that want people to have that. And, um, you know, one more thing I would just kind of bring up on this is, is, you know, especially if we have some frontline leaders on the call, you know, folks that are you know, developing your careers, um, it's okay to tell people what you're working on, you know, what you're strong at, what you need help on. Uh, I remember working with someone in the past and they, they had trouble with public speaking, um, making presentations. They just, they just, you know, had problems with that. And, you know, I, you know, I share with them like, well, do you have a mentor? Like, yeah, I have a mentor. Um, or do you have close coworkers that you work with? Yeah, I do. I do. Well, you know, maybe the next time you're making a presentation, just have them, you know, be in the back of the room. They're getting peers of yours. And then, you know, let them know that you're trying to work on different aspects of the presentation. They get some feedback afterwards. You know, it's those types of different things that you can do to continue to to ratchet up your skills. But again, we gotta kind of got make sure we ask for what we what you need to do, and um, the developed relationships are key. They're very key. They're very key. All right. Well, hopefully everyone got some good things out of this mentorship sponsorship discussion. Never too late to uh, add new allies to the team, um, but also too never too late um, to get the help that you need in order to be successful. All right. Cool. Well, we got some questions here for the panel. We're going to bounce around here a bit. So uh, Francis got a question for you. You know, we're all kind of, you know, in this post-COVID environment, you know, the, world, the work world looks a lot different um, than it did pre-COVID. And many of us are working from home or working in hybrid environments. And, you know, the way we work and network uh, for career development has changed. What are some of the ways you have been able to remain relevant, visible, 
for open opportunities and obtain those career development, career development that you need in this virtual environment? Oh, that is a great question, Niles. And there are so many areas that I can start off with. But what I'll say is um, show up. So I know we might be in a virtual environment, but the first thing people see about us is our physical presence, which ties right into our brand. So sometimes regardless of the work that we might be doing, if we are not presenting ourselves in a manner that is professional, uh, sometimes folks can have that as a negative connotation. Uh, so I would say first and foremost, just because we might be in an at-home environment, we should still look the part uh, because it is a great opportunity for folks to um, make an assessment of us as individuals, not even related to the work that we might be doing. Uh, second piece I would say in terms of that is fostering networks. So we heard feedback so far about how important connections are, um, building a strategic network, uh, and that can come through a number of ways. I think Damon mentioned earlier, having a virtual coffee with folks. Uh, so just because you're not seeing them in the hallways does not mean that we cannot get time. It's far easier at this point to get time on folks' calendar. Uh, so really connecting with folks um, outside of my work group. And I'll say one of the other things that um, COVID has blessed us with is an opportunity to connect with folks even outside of our home locations. Uh, so really expanding that network beyond what your working market might be. Um, leveraging mentors uh, who can help us guide our careers. And um, despite being in a virtual environment, we can identify those advocates and allies um, who can advocate for us uh, during those important career growth conversations. Um, being visible and responsive. Uh, so I mentioned virtual coffees. Another way to establish connections with folks is to join meetings early. Um, have discussions with folks prior to that meeting started, um, which is a great way to start to cultivate a relationship that you can continue to foster. Um, and I would say vastly important is joining and actively participating participating in professional organizations. Uh, so as Kathy shared, those can be internal to your organization. So your employee resource groups, your inclusion and diversity councils, or those development uh, networks like many of you uh, at the NAMIC event today. Um, but it's a really good opportunity in terms of um, professional organizations or employee resource groups to partner with like-minded folks uh, as well as work on initiatives that you might be passionate about uh, and allow others to see the work that you bring to the table that we might not have ordinarily had the opportunity to allow them to see us in our uh, professional space. Francis, that's, that's a wealth of information. And I think it, it all is important, you know, this post-COVID environment, you know, we have to be visible. Um, <clears throat> we have to, you know, look the part. So, so be invisible. Let me just translate that for a minute. Okay, you know, should I, should I get on these calls and in my PJs? And, and, and you should and, not. Huh? Absolutely not. I can't do that. Absolutely not. All right. Because All right. that that fosters a perception about the individual. So I think I have seen in many scenarios where folks have said, "I'm in an at-home environment, so I don't really dress as though I'm in the office." But when we look good, we perform well. So there's a direct tie-in to how we show up and the perceptions that exist as a result. Yeah, I like it. I like it. And, and the last point is important, you know, certainly getting up and still going through the routine, looking mm -hmm. good, getting your coffee, getting your breakfast sandwich, yeah. you know, getting your environment together. And I'm also too, that professional piece also is around also kind of, you know, I know a lot of people work from home, but, you know, you don't have a home office, just put a painting on the wall. You know, or, or or just or virtual background. You know, I think there's ways where, you know, it can we can remove some noise, remove some noise okay. um, from any type of discussion, and and you know those nuggets are that you mentioned are, are very key, very key, very good. Well, thank you. I appreciate you for that. Um, we're gonna switch over to Damon for a minute. So Damon, you know, um, we all are different. We're all built different. Some people are, you know, um, very boisterous leaders. Some people are kind of those those quiet leaders as well. So 
Um, some of us are introverts, you know, extroverts, and have a difficult time starting a conversation with someone. Um, what advice would you share? You know, how can they overcome that hesitation um, and, and really be confident about, you know, really expre expressing what they want, stepping up, standing out, and getting past, you know, maybe some of their internal struggles? Yeah. So interesting, and I saw this, you know, saw the question and, and ahead of time is, uh, I am an introvert at heart. Um, I know some people might not agree <laughs> or, or think otherwise because, you know, in being in recruiting, you're always out in the forefront, but I am an introvert at heart and my tendency is not to always put myself out there, but over the uh, course of time, you know, I've had to obviously, you know, from a career perspective. So the one thing I always tell myself or, you know, I told myself or I tell individuals on my team is starting a conversation is always uncomfortable for everybody. Um, so it's not something where it's just isolated to you. It's, it's, it's not easy just to go up to, to people just out of the blue and, and start a conversation. So I think first thing you need to do is look at the, the nature of the interaction. So if it's a networking event or an association meeting, you know, people are there to meet and to, to learn and to network. So you already are starting off with kind of a, you know, on step two or three of, of the, of the ladder to where, meeting someone, there's a little less awkwardness, you know, from that standpoint. And quite frankly, just going up and introducing yourself, maybe where you work or what you do, um, usually starts off the conversation. It's not as like, you know, it's as difficult as it sounds, um, but it's sometimes the simplest things will start, you know, a conversation to where you might have something in common with where they work or maybe where they're from, uh, or, you know, maybe a hobby that maybe you heard from a panel or something, you know, like this. Um, I think, in those networking and associating settings, that's kind of what people are there for. So there's a level of expectation of, I want to meet people. I want to, you know, uh, expand my network and maybe see how, how I can help others. With individual meetings, like let's say meeting a new leader or, or a new peer, um, I do that all the time. Uh, so for me, I always make sure I look at LinkedIn profiles or different things of that nature that I can uh, find and usually look for some something uh, I might have with them in common. Um, you know, so maybe it's, you know, the part of the country they're from or if they worked at a company that I'm familiar with, like I, I'll find ways to connect with them. And I think France just mentioned like, joining meetings early, like even before we dive into the conversation, I might mention something from a, a personal nature that I saw back when we were in the office, um, you know, all the time, I was the one that would scan the, the offices and I would look for pictures and I would look for little things in their office that would, would uh, pique my interest that I might ask about. And usually that just starts a conversation and usually eases into business and just lets people know that I am here to learn more about you as much as I'm here to learn about, you know, what we're here to talk about, whether, you know, their staffing needs or, or things of that nature. But I think realizing that generally people in either business settings or networking settings, they want, you know, they want to network, they want to talk. So it's just as it might be as comfortable for you, it's uncomfortable for them. And I think you just got to just do it. Um, and you'll be surprised on the reaction, you know, and the, and the interaction that you'll have. No, that's 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 great. Certainly great insight, um, you know, and, and great perspective around that. How to get the conversation started. Um, well, I'm I want to kind of add a side a side question to that. You know, mm -hmm. anybody can answer, and, and and this might this might be off script, but um, you know, if you're a you know an extrovert, right, and, and and you're you're in the conversation and you're you're answering the question before someone finishes, you know, and 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 you're just kind of ahead of what's going on. What can extroverts do that, that might mm -hmm. allow someone that's an introvert to be able to kind of jump in there, you know, and 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 play a little conversation double dutch, if you will, you know, I mean, anything extroverts need need to do to kind of ease the tension there. Anybody could jump in on that. Guess we're all introverts. We don't know. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny. I I was thinking, I was like, well, I have. I have my extrovert moments, right? So I think in those meetings, I will tell you where I'm in my extrovert you know, bag, I will say, I do read the room. I scan the kind of the room and just see who might be falling back a little bit and not to call people out. I might just put a pause and just say like, hey, does anyone else, you know, have anything they want to add to give them that opening? Um, because 
you can almost see sometimes where someone wants to say something, but they don't want to jump in. And when you have a bunch of A personalities, kind of especially in recruiters, when you know we're in a room, you you better jump in, or you know someone's gonna have to pause the conversation. And so I I've I have done that to where we you know you kind of just scan the room and just kind of see it. it looks like you know Mary has something to say you know mentally. Let me let's let's put a pause and just see if anyone else has and just kind of take the air out just a little bit and let you know those individuals that just need that don't feel comfortable jumping in just to to step in and say here's what you know i you know i think from the topic so i think that's good for introverts and extroverts just reading the room but that is you know something that i've done personally very good yeah mary did you want to jump in on that or you I, I would agree with everything Damon just said. I I am an introvert. People don't believe that. Um, I'm I like to say I'm an introvert with extrovert tendencies. Um, just because certain roles that you have in your career force you to be more out front, whether you're comfortable with that or not. Um, but I think reading the room is key. But I also think those who are extroverts know they are, and I think sometimes they just need to be more self aware that the other person they're having a conversation with hasn't spoken a word. And so that they just need to say, hey, ask for their input. And that could be that could be helpful. The other thing that I try to do, knowing that, <clears throat> sorry, knowing that um, when I'm in a networking situation, I'm not always comfortable and it is hard to go up to people. I try to find the person who's standing on the outside of the room, who's not in the mix, because I know that person's standing there and they're, they're really struggling to step into the room. And then I will go over to them and just start, you know, asking, you know, their name or where where they work or what what some of their interests are or how they like the event so far, just to get them a little bit more comfortable with the situation. And when I was, um, you know, with WICT, we, we started wearing name badges. And the reason we wore those name badges was so that the people who went to the events knew that when they saw our badge, we were at least somebody that they could come up to and talk to and start you know, getting comfortable in the environment. And we had our team go out and say, hey, I'm, I'm Mary, I'm on the board of WICT, um, welcome to this event. And that sort of softened them up a little bit. And that was hard because I am an introvert and I'm, I do have, I am shy. So that is kind of hard for me to do, but I know it's harder for the person standing on the outside of the room. Uh, well, I appreciate you both, you know, sharing that information. I mean, I think it's important to kind of hit both sides of it. Um, but certainly, um, and you mentioned a key role, key information about roles too. I mean, certainly, you know, sometimes the role does dictate. I mean, even though you're an introvert or extrovert, you got to shift here because um, you got to show up you know, on what's, whatever's taking place. So I, I appreciate you all sharing that, um, that expertise and that sidebar question there. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary, you know, we'll stick with, stay with you for here for a little bit. So what's something you wish someone told you early in your career? You know, as you oh, reflect. There's so many things. Um, well, one of the first things I, I wish I had known, I came more from a background that was like nose to the grindstone. You have to be 100 percent, you know, be be more competent. You know, you have to be an expert at what you do, right? And your work, you put nose to the grindstone and you're gonna succeed that way, right? That's not really how it happens. So you have to be competent, but you have to have that confidence, but you have to be seen. Competence gets you to the door, but it's that soft stuff that gets you through the door, right? So I wish somebody had told me early on, yeah, you do the work, that's great, but you have to be seen. So. When you're, you know, when there's somebody leaving the company and they're having cake, get up from your desk and go to that cake ceremony or go to the holiday party or when they're having some sort of announcement, get up from your desk, even though it's hard because you're on deadline. I worked in traffic. We had deadlines every hour, every quarter hour, every day, every week. So it was hard for us to get up. But I know that that was important to go to those things. So, and being seen, telling people what you're working on, self-promote. If you meet somebody in the elevator and they ask you, how are you doing today? Don't just say, oh, I'm really busy. Say what you're doing. Tell people what you're working on. If you're working on a launch of something new, tell them that. Or tell if you're a coach for your child's team, tell them that that's what you're working on. 
um, be seen, self-promote. It's not bragging if it's true. Um, tell people if you just want something, you know, share that with people. Hey, yeah, I just got this really great award for something I was working on. Um, share who you are with people, because I think that's really important. I think setting boundaries is something that I know I didn't do early on in my career. Yes, you're going to have to work late. Yes, you might have to work on a day off. But every day can't be a crisis because I know I didn't work in crisis management. So every day should not have been a crisis. I worked in news, but every day, you know, you should be able to go home at a decent hour and not have all three meals at work. So setting boundaries is really an important thing that you should start early on. And I know you can't always in your progression negotiate your salary, but you certainly can do it when you're first getting started, whether you're a new person, you're changing jobs, that's the most important time to set that salary band because it's going to affect everything you do moving forward. Um, so, and if they tell you that's their final offer, it probably isn't. They usually give you that mid-range, either low to mid-range. So there's about a 10% wiggle room. So I would strongly recommend setting and, you know, doing nego some negotiating when you're first starting out with your salary. Um, what else? There was uh, probably some other things I would think about, but that those are probably like the key things. Oh, and yeah. And when you're asking for a raise, have the goods. Don't just go in and say, I want to raise. Show your goods. Show the goals that you've achieved, your successes, what you've done that was above and beyond, what you're currently doing in your role. Maybe your role changed from that job description you got when you first started and you're doing so many other things now. Your role has changed present that to them. So you want to have the goods when you ask the question. Um, and that's just stuff that I learned over the years and what I've seen from other people starting out that, and I try to tell them, Hey, you should be doing this because, you know, you should be promoting yourself. You should be seeing, you get up and out there networking. Um, these are all really important things. Like we think we're working really hard and that's important. But I know one day I lifted my head up from that desk and I said, where the heck did my social circle go? Where did my network go? Because I was so busy working that I kind of let some things slip along the way. So I would say those are some of the key things that I, I like to share with people, whether they're just starting out or I notice that they're falling into those patterns that we get taught. Preach. Yeah. Mary. I, mean, I probably uh, could go on, but you know, you're, you're, I mean, those are, and those, it, it, there's so many different things, you know, you can learn when you're still starting out early in your career. And what Mary shared today, you know, are just some really key things. And so hopefully, talk about standing out, you know, it's okay, you know, even on the comp side, you know, sometimes I coach individuals like, yeah, when you're interviewing for a job, it, there is a range, right? And sometimes they come with the question, like, you know, tell me what's your number? What's your number? Like your question should be, uh, well, I understand the job has a um, salary range. Can you share me what the range of the job is? And and so so there's ways of coaching to help people through that where people are more comfortable about their worth. Right. And I think that's become very important in our post-COVID environment, um, um, probably more so than pre-COVID. But um, but yeah, I, I know that from from all of us on the panel, we could probably share lots of different things. But those are those some key things, and, and I think also to the piece around setting boundaries. Um, you know, real quick here, my first manager, my first manager, HR manager, while I was at Kraft, worked at a plant that had 2,000 employees. He saw, you know, I, I was learning stuff, trying to learn stuff, trying to meet people. He was like, Niall, there's something to be said for being too available. Yes. You know, it, 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 you know it's okay to say no. It's okay to get out of here between 5 and 5.30, you know. Um, and there's all, there will always be one more call, one more issue, one more complaint. You know, one more crisis, you know, so protect your, your mental health, have boundaries, um, but it, make sure you, you set some things around where you're not becoming so available that um, you just kind of get yourself behind. So great, great points, Mary. God, when you're point. too available, you're the person that gets all that work. Yeah. Because the other people are playing golf with the boss while you're That's back right. there fixing the problems. And you want to balance that. You know when there's, you'll know when it's time to stay late. You'll know when it's time to work on that day off. Um, but it, it can't be every day. And that's that's something that ha we have to have some balance. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, no, hey, Kathy, I'm going to bounce over to you here with a question. All right. You ready, Kathy? I'm ready. 
All right. So, you know, the whole job search piece, you know, it can be stressful, you know, and, and kind of going through that process, whether it be promotions, jobs you're applying for. And some of us have been rejected for jobs we apply for on a few occasions. How do you bounce back from rejection and leverage the feedback provided to prepare for the next role that you're applying for? So give us some tidbits on that, that bounce back piece. Yeah. Uh, wow. So I've had a few heartbreaks. Uh, bouncing back absolutely can be rough. And I think, you know, it's always important to ask for feedback. And while sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow, it's really important that you listen to the recommendations and you consider their perspective. If you're really lucky, you'll gain specific insights that are actionable that will help with your development. Those are kind of the golden nuggets that you're looking for. And when you have it, it's you know critical that you take action, but also that you remain in touch with that leader. It could be sharing progress. It could be using Damon's RAPK recommendation, which is brilliant. Um, and you need to remain in, you know, in contact with that leader and thank them for their support. Just because they didn't hire you for that role doesn't mean that they're not going to consider you in the future for other roles or recommend you to their colleagues for roles on their team. Now, other times I'll tell you, um, you may get feedback that you either simply don't agree with or it's really vague. It could be something like, yeah, you were well qualified for the, the, the position. You'd be a great fit for the role, but we decided on another candidate. Um, now, it's, it's difficult, but politely accepting that decision and listening to their feedback is going to be critical to your future reputation. So there's a lot of factors that leaders have to consider when they're hiring a candidate. And so even if they're vague, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't value you. So finally, I'll say that if you think you're qualified and you know that you could do the job well, you know, it's possible that there's other roles that you're just not aware of that would also be a fantastic fit. So don't get discouraged. Make sure you listen to the feedback, take action on, on feedback, don't burn any bridges and you just got to keep pushing forward when it's the right time. It's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Kathy, for that. I mean, certainly, you know, rejection can be, can be, can be heartbreak, right? Now, now what if I come back and, and you know what, uh, I'm kind of applying for everything. You know, I'm just trying to, to, to get, I'm, I'm, I got rejected. Now I'm, I'm just trying to really get in the door. Now, what, what's your advice to denial if, if I'm doing something like that? I think you need to be targeted about uh, the role and, and be, you know, specific, understand, you know, what you're looking for. Don't just apply for everything out there. Um, so so you need to be working with advisors, mentors um, to understand, hey, you know, what are those right roles and have conversations around, you know, what your strengths are, what you're interested in. And it kind of goes back to, hey, you know, what is uh, career progression. And I kind of got, you know, early in my career, you know, I thought about career progression simply being climbing the ladder during your working life. And for many, and for me, when I was, you know, early on in my career, it meant promotions. Um, and over time, though, I realized that it's not linear. It's not defined by other people's expectations. And it doesn't always need to follow a traditional uh, corporate career pathing structure either. It's up to the individual. So at this point in my career, I kind of define career progression as continuous growth that's going to allow me to maximize the value that I can provide in demand, gaining value from my current and prospective employers. And so it doesn't necessarily mean a promotion, doesn't necessarily translate into a lateral role within my organization. Or even another organization, it may be outside of the company, but instead focusing on gaining knowledge and gaining skills and improving competencies. And that kind of goes back to, you know, what should you apply for? You should apply for things that interest you, um, that you think that you can do, but are interesting to you, not just everything that might help you that you think that you could move up the ladder, um, but instead be a bit more intentional about the things that you value. I like it. I like it. And, and, you know, it provides, you know, certainly good focus and give people options. And we're going we're gonna to stay on this a little bit, but a little bit differently. Okay. So I'm going to switch over to David here for a minute. So Kathy talked about overcoming rejection, right? Yeah. What advice would you give someone who is interested but nervous about making a career pivot into an entirely different work group? 
Yeah. Yeah, that's always a tough, uh, you know, conversation, you know, for people to have. And what I would always tell people is don't focus on like the functional or technical skills and like the gap, like, well, I don't have experience with XYZ software or something of that nature, but focus on, you know, take inventory of the skills that you have, those transferable skills, those soft skills that you um, have uh, developed over the course of your career. See if there's a, you know, a similarity or you know, a, a comparison to the new role or the new area that you are, are, are trying to gain entry into. If it's an area that's like a boundary partner, um, you know, to, to a current role, you know, you can look at it as I can bring a different perspective. Maybe I'm the, the business partner or the end user for this particular group, or maybe I'm the, you know, the third level of the, the chain, you know, within, within, this, uh, within this process, my group handles that, you know, you might be able to bring a different level of experience and expertise um, to that group uh, and insights that maybe you might not have that exact experience, but you are able to bring your current experience and, and expertise into that role. And a, a really perfect example is my wife works for the CDC. Um, she had worked in laboratories throughout her career, but she had just moved into a procurement position. She's never done anything around procurement, but it's procurement of laboratory equipment and laboratory, you know, uh, things. I don't even know it's science and stuff, but laboratory things and her knowledge of how the, the scientists work. Uh, and the tools they use is helping on the procurement side, but she's learning, you know, those new skills and she was nervous, you know, about moving into that. But I think what she's finding now is I have the transferable skills. I just need to learn, you know, how, how to now do this job, but I'm utilizing the same knowledge base that I've gained over the course of, of years. So I think that is, that is the big, the big piece for me is looking at those skills that you've currently developed and mapping it kind of to the skills for that area you want to be in and find those similarities um, to where you can utilize that knowledge. Yeah. Great feedback from both of you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for bringing those things forward. Um, bouncing back is important, you know, making shifts is important, doing it right is important, focusing is important. Um, and, and those are just all key aspects of it and getting good feedback. You know, um, if you don't, you know, it's okay to ask those questions. Um, don't run around with your hair on fire, so to speak. Um, get good feedback, really understand what are those things I need to be working on, and then take action. Take action, you know, be intentional about working on that feedback um, so that next time around, um, you're in a situation where you're, you're better positioned. And to the point that was made earlier, it's like, you know, sometimes it's not about, you know, always about your um, ability. Sometimes it's about your availability. And so applying for those roles, that might be a stretch. It might be opening the door for getting that next call about this job is not for you, but this job is for you. You know, I need you to apply to this job. So I think those are all key points that we want to make sure we, we drive on. But you, you guys did a great job providing some great feedback on how to stand up and stand out and deal with rejection. Damon, you want to mention something real quick? Yeah, up. just really quick because I know we're getting you know close on time is one thing that I would also say, and I think you know, Kathy was talking about um in the last question, rejection and things of that nature. One thing I would always say is as internals, when you apply for jobs internally, we tend to um not I'm not gonna say not show up, but maybe not present ourselves the same way we would from an external perspective. We assume people know what I've done. We assume people know my background. And what I always say is approach that internal job the same way you would as an external, because if they are looking internally and externally, you are being compared to those externals who are showing up that way. Um, so I have seen where internals were, you know, kind of the front runner going into roles that came out with out the roles because of how they didn't, you know, or approach that position. So it's very important to, I think it's kind of going back to a little bit of Kathy, a little bit of Mary, just, you know, speaking up, you know, sharing your story. Don't assume people know your background or what you've done um, and, and, and put your best foot forward when you, you know, when you come up internally. Uh, I, I like it. You know, those are great things. You know, avoid you know, going into interviews, not preparing or taking it too lightly, you know, answer questions with, well, you know, you know, I was working on this project and, you know, it's like, no, I don't, don't know. You know, I need to walk you through what was taking place there. Great feedback. Thanks for that follow up. Yeah. Hey, Francis, you know, we're going to turn it over to you here. Um, so owning your journey, your career journey um, and taking control of your career and the role of leadership. How do you view the role of leadership with regards to development? Well, this is probably one of my favorite questions. Um, and 
I'll pivot a moment um, because I want to add the myth buster. Um, the person who owns our journey is us. So we should be the captain of our careers. Um, one of the best things that we can do is outline our career agenda um, as it ensures that one, we're intentional about it, navigating our journey. No one knows better than we do in terms of time. So what is your time relative to how you want your journey to navigate? Um, what money you desire and what pace you want your career journey to progress. We know the activities, we know the sacrifices that we're willing to make um, and what we've defined as success. I think Kathy touched on it a lot of times. So what is success could be impressed upon us, but we can have a better idea of that if we know what is on our agenda. It allows us to focus on our plan, um, what we want and how we're going to get it and it allows us to go back to our why, particularly when things become challenging, and they will, um, that will help keep us on track. Now, to answer your question, I will say the leaders play a really important um, and meaningful role in our career journey as well, um, in terms of providing support, creating structure, um, holding us accountable, and connecting us with resources that we may not necessarily be aware of. Um, they probably can identify blind spots. It's very rare that folks are self-aware. Um, so it really is critical in having folks help us through what are some gaps in terms of things that we might be missing, particularly as we are looking at particular roles within the organization um, and having ongoing conversations. Um, and when I say an ongoing cadence of conversations, I am not talking about your annual evaluation. We should be bring, bringing forward to our leaders a coaching plan and thinking on things that we might think that we're doing well, talking about things that might be gaps and looking for opportunities for projects or stretch assignments or initiatives that will help us bridge those uh, gaps that we might have um, as we are having that conversation. So I'd say really it's a partnership. It's owned by the employee, but it's supported by the leader. I like it. You know, I mean, you brought about captain, you know, we're all CEOs, you know, and of our careers mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you know, whether you're that you know, frontline employee, you know, that, that senior leader, um, you know, do, do your job well, you mm -hmm. know, and but also, you know, take control over the direction of your career. Um, and, but, but I'm, I'm going to kind of ask that question. I'm going to kind of do a side question on that one. So, so what am I, what, what if I'm frontline team member, I'm skilled at what I do. I'm, I'm making good money. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying life, enjoying work. Um, do I need to pursue climbs to the corporate ladder? What if I'm just good where I'm at? Absolutely not. Um, I think it's continuing to hone that craft. So if you are comfortable in the place that you're in, continue to be the very best uh, in that role. So we have individuals within our organization. There is not a desire um, to move beyond the current role. And that is absolutely okay. But still focus on what things can you do to improve the work group that you are a part of. Uh, even though you're a high performer and you have no desire to do anything differently. Yeah. And I bring that up. because I think that's very beneficial. It's like at, at mm -hmm. some point in your, your careers, um, no matter what job you're doing, um, it goes back to a point that was made earlier by another panelist is you have to define promotion for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's um, uh, money, you know, sometimes it's title, sometimes it's opportunity, but you have to define that for yourself. Um, um, Cause I, you know, you know, I think it's big and small as I coin this term, maybe uh, more, more, more money, more problems. Um, so so you guys got to be clear on um, what you want. You also understand that it's OK to really focus on developing in the role that you're in. There's no it's not a race to this thing um, and really be proficient at what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, appreciate that. And um, another thing I want to just kind of bring up here before we open up to the audience, um, you know, imposter syndrome. I want to kind of talk about this a little bit. Then we'll just have a couple of panels, panelists speak to it, and then we'll open it up to the audience. But 
Imposter syndrome is defined as the battles within yourself discouraging you from going after what you desire despite your accomplishments. Um, will anyone be um, good with sharing a time when you did not let the negative self-talk stop you from moving forward with the career decision? So maybe a couple of panelists can speak on that for us. I guess I could jump off um, and start off. Um, being, I, I, I'm not sure if it's, if I have the imposter syndrome because I'm an introvert or, 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 or a woman, I know a lot of everybody has it to different degrees. And it is something I struggle with. I mean, even doing today's panel was like, I was like, yes. And then I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, and then meeting everybody, I was like, oh, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. So one of the things that I like to do and um, has helped me when I've pushed myself into other parts of my career is I like to look back. Some people call it a brag book, but I like to look back at my list of accomplishments, things that I've done, things that I've done similar to today. For example, I went back and I looked, all right, I've done this. I've talked to people before. I've shared things before. I can speak and it's hard to speak in public. I, it's something that I get really fearful of. Um, but I looked back at my things and I said, you know what? I can do this. There's stuff I can share. And maybe there's a nugget that I can give people that are listening that they can use to move forward. And that's sort of what I did to get out of that spiral that started. Um, same thing when when I got involved with, uh, with WIT, you know, I didn't think I could run it as the president of the New York chapter, but I had to go back and look at some of the things that I had already accomplished before that to give me that impetus to, to say, you know, I really can do this. I see the progression. And I know the negative thoughts that we get, it, it is a, it's a mechanism within our brain that's a safety mechanism because your brain is always trying to keep you safe. So that's where some of your negative thoughts come from. So what you have to do is like really look at your, your life overall and all the things that you've accomplished. And you say to yourself, thanks for the protection, but I got this. I've done A before and I can do it again. Maybe I've done B and it didn't work so great, but I know how to fix it and I can move forward. Um, and that's sort of what I try to do. I also did a power pose when we were, before we went live <laughs> and just to build up, you know, that courage inside to, to, to move forward. So I think that's some of the things I've done. And even in, you know, I'm, I like to say I'm still in transition after leaving Time Warner Cable and Charter. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do was start my own company. And that was a really, oh my God, you talk about imposter syndrome, like that's every five minutes here. Um, but I really looked back at even just running the New York chapter of WIC, like you guys know from running NAMIC, it, it's just not a small thing that you're doing here. I mean, this is a big undertaking. It's like a whole second job and it's a whole like small business, if you will. And so I tried to use some of that experience and put it into creating my own business and moving forward. And I'm even doing some travel on the side because that's another tip. Always have a side hustle going on. Um, protect yourself for the future because you never know when you're going to get laid off. Um, but I've tried to look at some of those things and said, you know what, I can do this. Like when somebody came to me and said, would you like to do travel? I was like, oh my God, I can't do that. But you know what? I planned events before. I've produced events before. There's no difference between doing that and planning somebody's vacation. I've done traffic. I can schedule the wazoo out of anything. So I could do that. So I had to like build myself up by looking at my past accomplishments, my past roles and finding those skills and those transferable skills that we were talking about before and, and moving forward with that. So that's sort of some of the things I do, but I would suggest a Brad book. You can call it whatever you want. Put those kudos in there. If your manager gave you, you know, a quick email, Hey, that was a great job. Print it out, put it in the book. If somebody stopped you in the hallway, write it down, write down your goals, keep those really great reviews that you've gotten because, you know, they're meaningful for you to move forward with your confidence. Confidence is key. If you don't have confidence. It, it, it just, you, you can't move forward without it. You have to have confidence in yourself and in your abilities. So that's sort of love what it. I would do. Love it. Love it. Like, like the idea about the kudo book that helps you remember what you got accomplished. And we all doing a lot of great things. Yeah. So I appreciate you sharing that. And we don't of... always remember the things that we do, right? We don't, we, we think that we don't accomplish things, but you're accomplishing stuff 
every minute of the day. It might not be grandiose, but you're still doing stuff. And you should look at yourself in a positive light and stop the negative. And it's hard. We all do it. We get that loop, but we have to look back and and go to your advisor or your mentor and, and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? And they will definitely do that. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing that, Mary. All right. Well, hey, uh, one more panelist. Anyone else want to jump in there? Or did Mary, did Mary tackle that one on the imposter syndrome? Anyone else want to jump in there? Yeah, I'll jump in. I mean, ditto for everything that Mary said, but, you know, I, I think it's, you know, <clears throat> to the point that you have transferable, you know, competencies. Um, and so you need to focus on those. You need to lean in on the value that you provide and that you can provide, um, but also recognize that there's opportunity to grow in the role. And so while we always talk about hit the ground running and immediately provide biz business value, yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that within that role, you already have to be way up here. So there's going to be an expectation that you're going to grow within that role. And so, you know, the question is, why not me, right? Um, so you need to focus on what the value that you bring to that role and go for it, reach for it, have the confidence um, to, to, you know, to absolutely apply for that job. Absolutely. No, those are great points, you know, about confidence and really just, you know, not psyching yourself out, you know, and, and get into this negative self-talk. So appreciate you both for sharing insight on that. Well, hey, we come to the point now where, you know, there's some questions from the group. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank the panelists um, for, for all the great insight. But let's just kind of keep the discussion going with a few questions that have popped up in the chat. So question number one, you know, for an internal employee, should you reach out to the hiring manager prior to your interview for any reason to ask questions about the job? Or, you know, just meet the individual, you know, certainly at the point of interview. So interested in anyone jumping off mute there from the panel, you know, for an internal employee, should you reach out to a hiring manager prior to your interview for any reason? Any thoughts there? I'll jump in really quick. I would say if your paths crossed, um, I would say before the interview, yes. Um, if it doesn't, I would probably, if you have questions, I would probably defer to the recruiter. I know that's the recruiter and me, um, because sometimes you could put that hiring leader in an awkward, you know, kind of situation. Um, and you just don't want that awkwardness kind of flowing into uh, the interview. So I would say if for some reason the paths cross, whether it's at an event or, you know, or, or a meeting or something, I would say take advantage of, of the opportunity. Um, but if if not, I would defer to the recruiter if you have questions that you might want to an have answered prior to, to the interview. Okay. Yeah. That's the recruiter. <laughs> recruiter answer. Uh, <laughs> so. any, any different views from the panel? One more person? No, I, I agree with uh, what Damon said. I think though, if you do have questions, you can reach out to the HR group or if you know people in that department, maybe you can feel them out a little bit about um, what they're looking for, what kind of um, team person would 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 fit better with you know with that group. Get to know them a little bit. I would stay away from the hiring manager because I do think that is that could be a problem. Great insight. Great insight. Second question here for an internal employee: Does a hiring manager have access to your individual development plan? or career plan? Oh, I would say I think it depends on who the hiring manager is. If it's your manager that's hiring for that position, yeah, they sure do. If it's somebody in another department, they likely do not, unless they're on a higher level in the company, and then they probably might. Okay. Mr. Recruiter, any any other insight there? That sounds spot on. Uh, I, I agree with Mary. I, I mean, I think if it's within your line of kind of responsibility or leadership chain, they probably do. But outside of that, no, um, I don't think they do. Yeah. And, and from an HR standpoint, you know, those things are typically locked down. Yeah. So to so agree. So in your line of succession, the manager yeah. will have access. Um, but, you know, you know, it, so you don't have to go in there fearing something. Um, and your development plan, you know, coming across, you might be asked about your development plan um, and sort of be prepared to ask those questions, but they don't have just carte blanche access to that type of stuff. So, 
All right, next question. What is the best resource for people? Um, I just wanted to jump in real quick. Sometimes HR might come to that person and and share that maybe that interview is not something that should happen because there could be something happening in the background that we are not aware of or cannot be aware of. So that Great. does happen from time to time. Yep. Great addition there. Appreciate that. What is the best resource for people that want to dive deeper into their career? Um, so that's a question that came from you. What is the best resource uh, for people that want to dive deeper into their career? You know, I think we all have things we probably dive into to kind of stay afloat and know what's going on. I know with Sherm, you know, that's kind of the group for HR. There's a plethora of information that on labor law and things that are changing within HR. Um, so it, it may just be, you know, talking with your manager and, and, or mentors and just kind of understand a little bit more about what you're wanting to accomplish and then them directing you to the right resources. But panel, feel free to jump in there. I would say join a professional network like NAMIC. Um, and if there's anybody on this call not a member, I would strongly recommend that you join. Um, and if you are a member, get involved with NAMIC, volunteer, um, join a committee, get on a board with them. Um, it's a great way to stretch. You know, you do stretch assignments in a safe environment. It's a great way to learn new stuff in a safe environment, but you also learn a lot about your industry within the organization itself. And I would say that would be a great way to go. Great. Great question. Great question. All right, this last question that came from the audience um, while we have time here, and I'm gonna ask folks, I'm, I'm gonna ask for permission, we might just go a few minutes over, um, but what has helped you to get to where you are and what advice would you give someone that wants to go in a similar direction? So what has helped you get to where you are and what advice would you give to someone that wants to go in a similar direction? No, happy to, oh, sorry, happy to kick it off here. So I would say it goes back to having a plan. So know the direction that you want to go and know that mobility is not always upwards, that sometimes there is value in taking a side step for a future progression within the organization and make sure others are aware of the direction that you want to take. Uh, I think early on, as I mentioned, folks speaking on our behalf when we're not in the room, those folks also need to know what's our path or what's on our plan. I certainly do not want anyone in the room saying things that I want to do when it does not align with my plan. So make sure you are articulating consistently what direction you want to take your career. Make sure you are performing at maximal capacity in current role and foster relationships that you might need in terms of roles that you want to move into in the organization before there is a posting. So Damon mentioned he was talking from an HR standpoint. It's not the time to talk to a recruiter when the job is posted. You should be fostering that connection, learning about that position or that organization far before there is a posting that takes place, if that is part of your plan. Like it. Anyone else from the panel want to jump in there? Thank you, Francis, for that great advice. Yeah, I, I would just say what Francis mentioned about, you know, being taking care of your current role, I call that my desk. So it's taking care of your desk before you start taking on all these extra projects and things of that nature, because a lot of times we are judged on our desk. Um, so if you don't take care of what you're assigned to do, what you're paid to do, um, that's going to be the first thing you're judged on and maybe not so all the other projects and you know and other things that you have done it would be how are they taking care of business for the things that we are, are expecting them to do so um, for me i've always focused on taking care of my desk um while and then making sure that that was taken care of before i take on other things and then foster and building relationships um with with all levels and internal and external has always been a, a, a piece for me excellent i'll, I'll jump in Oh, no. You got it. All right. All right. Last, last thing I'll, I'll jump in. So, you know, 
I agree. A plan is really important, but I think it's also equally important to remember that roles evolve. And so that shiny VP role that you might be looking at now and want to pursue may no longer exist, um, you know, down the road 10, 15 years. And it may no longer be a role that you'd be satisfied with uh, based on your progression. So um, again, having that long-term goal is really important, but it's rem it's it's important to remember that change happens. Uh, so you need to remain a bit agile and open to opportunities that you may have not typically considered. And so instead, I, I would encourage you to focus on gaining knowledge, gaining skills, uh, improving your competencies um, on things that are interesting to you and that and also consider, um, you know, making sure that that aligns with your prediction of you know what the market might need in the next three to five years to kind of insulate and protect yourself because again things things constantly change roles are changing and new technologies being introduced um, so consider long term but make sure that you're also positioning yourself to be agile agility is very important as these jobs continue to evolve great advice mary you want to round us out here in 30 seconds I, I agree with everything everybody said. Be be able to pivot. You're not stuck to your plan. Revi you know, I would say maybe look at your plan once a quarter or at least twice a year to see if you're still on track and it still aligns with what you want to be doing. Awesome. Well, hey, let's give our panel a virtual or, or in-person hand clap. Really thank, you know, Catherine, Kathy Ross, Francis Lewis, uh, Damon Herring, and also Mary um, Shilling for getting on a call here today and really sharing your advice, your insight, your knowledge. Um, and hopefully everyone took away some insight. This is all about sharing, right? And it's all about application. And hopefully you found something here you can take away, be intentional about, so you can stand up um, and also be successful when we move forward here in all of your career success. Stand up and stand out. Very good. Well, thank you all for being on. Just a couple of announcements here as we wrap up. Um, I also want to thank um, to Kanye Hammond and Derek Williams. Um, these are our NAMIC Virginia board um, um, members that have been hard at work with putting this event together. Um, Lakaisha as well, thank you for jumping on and, and kicking us off. I really appreciate your time and also to help organize this event also. Um, just a reminder, you know, um, this event has been recorded. We will send out the information for those folks that were not able to join um, or might have had some issues joining or whatnot. Um, so you can review this at your leisure. Um, but certainly, um, keep an eye out on the NAMIC website, follow us on social media. Uh, we do have another session coming up in August. Um, it's the Future of Cloud Service panel. Uh, so we're going to tackle that um, uh, topic here in August. Um, but really, thank you all for jumping on to this call. Um, thank you again, panelists. And with that, um, you all have a great day. Thank you.